today we're going to be looking at Bible translations. This is a big question. A lot of uh, Christians and non-Christians alike ask these sorts of questions. What are the different translations of the Bible, or versions of the Bible, as some people say? Um, what, you know, what's the difference between them? Does it matter? Are, is one better than the rest? Which one should I read? Which one do you read? What's your favorite? You know, these are very popular questions. So, what I wanted to do is uh, give a little introduction for those who are um, unfamiliar with the subject, an introduction to Bible translations. Not so much the process of it or the history of it, but just in terms of what is out there right now. And inevitably, I'll talk a little bit about history because uh, that's kind of the person I am, but um, I'm just focusing on what is out there right now and what options you can find today. So first of all, we should ask what a translation actually is, what that even means. So translation is the process or the product of taking something in one language and putting it into another. So every, every, Bible, every Bible that you read basically is a translation, unless you can read Paleo-Hebrew or Koine Greek or um, you know, Aramaic in certain sections of the Old Testament. Uh, if you look at a Bible translation chart, and there are tons of them out there. Almost every Bible publisher has one, and it's, you know, just a quick Google search or internet search will yield you plenty of examples right away. Usually they use the terms word for word on one end and paraphrase on the other. This is kind of a useful scale, but it's not necessarily the best. It's a... It, I, I'm almost tempted to say it's a bit biased, it, it, in, and it misuses some of those terms. So I'm going to use some more um, traditional language translation terms. You've got three types. You've got a gloss, a paraphrase, and an imitation. So a gloss is a very, very basic kind of translation. You start with the original word, and then you replace it with the best fit translation word, as best as you can figure out. Then you go on to the next word, the next word, the next word. Uh, so you might switch the word order around a little bit, maybe toss in some punctuation so you can kind of read it better in the new language. But otherwise, it's very, very limited. Um, no Bible translation out there completely falls into this category. Uh, because it just doesn't yield anything particularly readable. I have an example I wrote, I worked out a little while ago. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 would read, It happened, and in days those went out a decree from Caesar Augustus to register all the inhabitants. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the word order is a bit messy, and... Um, it doesn't flow, it doesn't sound like English, but if you read it carefully and slowly, you can see, oh, okay, I see what that means. Uh, you know, it happened, and in days those went out, a decree from Caesar Augustus to register all the inhabitants. Now, the useful thing about a gloss translation, or you can see this in an interlinear Bible, where it has the original language and then a translation of the words of each word underneath it, or above it, um, the, the, the advantage of that kind of translation resource is that you can see the original word order in the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic or the Latin or whatever other language you are working with at the, uh, at the time. But um, anyway, so the usefulness of that is found in you can see where the how the word order affects the emphasis of the sentence in the original languages. Um, sometimes, well, in English especially, we have a language that is very, very dependent upon a very static word order. You can, if you reorder the words in a sentence, you change the meaning very easily, or you just break our rules of grammar. Whereas in a lot of other languages, you can change the word order around a lot more freely in order to emphasize certain things. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's just what the gloss is, and um, you don't really see that unless you're getting an interlinear Bible. So the middle category after gloss is a paraphrase, and despite what most Bible charts say, a paraphrase is the standard type of translation, and virtually everything you ever see is a paraphrase. 
instead of going word by word like a gloss, this method of translation goes phrase by phrase, hence paraphrase. It's seeking not only to reorder the words so that the new language makes sense, but it also uses the context of the phrase and the sentence to figure out what individual words are supposed to mean. In, so you know, context is coming in to the question here. If you just look at the Hebrew word nefesh on its own, uh, you'll probably translate it as wind. That's a very normal way of translating it. Uh, but then you see, oh, it's in the phrase nefesh Elohim. Oh, uh, that's probably God's spirit, not God's wind. <laughs> so, you know, context comes into this. And so all for, at this point, this is where interpretation starts coming into the question of how to translate. All paraphrases and, and other forms of translation, the paraphrases and the imitations both, all require some degree of interpretation. You can't just say, this is a word for word, literal translation. No, that is a gloss. And there are no gloss Bibles because they're not readable and they don't make much sense. So virtually every Bible translation you pick up is technically a paraphrase. The third example or third type of translation is the imitation. The imitation is taking a text in one language and then rewriting it as if the original author was living in the current day speaking the current languages, the current language, current language. So most English Bibles don't fall into this category, uh, but there are many Bible translation projects out there for overseas mission fields that do draw upon this method. Uh, why? Why would you do that? Why don't you just stick with the text and, and keep it? as straightforward as possible. Well, sometimes the reasons are very simple. What do you do with a culture that doesn't know what a sheep is? Do you just tell them this is that Jesus is the Lamb of God and then you have to have a whole aside to explain what sheep are and why that's important? Or are you going to pick some other animal that will be recognizable in their culture as a sacrificial animal? What if a language doesn't have a word for love? Or it doesn't have a word for righteousness. What are you going to do? I mean, you have to use the, the language that you're in, translating into. So those are some um, more innocent reasons for an imitation. Uh, sometimes um, Bible translations get a bit self-referential. And you know, we, we cling to some archaic words that have changed their meaning or have been dropped from regular use, and so some Bible translations have been made as imitations to sort of recapture a freshness to the text. Um, so there are examples like the message, which is more of an imitation than a paraphrase, because it's dealing with the text and then saying, all right, let's, let's make this sound like uh, the average Joe on the street in 1970s America talking. And boom, you've got the message. Maybe 1980s, I forget when it was written. It took him a while, I guess, so. Anyway, so um, this also applies to a change of media. Like if you make um, a Jesus film, there are tons of them out there, but you know, those are all imitations because you know, you're taking the medium of text and you're Get, turning into a medium of video. Um, there will always be changes from the book version to the to the movie version or any other media change. Uh, comic, there are, there are comic books of, of the Bible as well. Um, that too is very much an, an imitation because you know, you're not just working from text, you're doing different things as well. So got to make this point about interpretation. I've, I've hinted at this or begun to mention it, but I need to emphasize this now. Every translation basically involves interpretation. There is no way around it. And the reason for this is simple. No two languages are the same. Now, if they're very similar languages, then the a direct translation works a lot better. If you're going from Latin to Spanish, for example, there's a lot less change involved than if you're going from ancient Hebrew to modern English. 
know, a lot of differences take place there. So interpretation is not about changing the meaning. Sometimes people use interpretation in a very negative way, like it's some sort of um, you know, conspiracy to obfuscate the meaning of the text uh, and use weird words like obfuscate to confuse people. But really, interpret and translate basically mean the same thing. Yes, interpretations can be done poorly or incorrectly, just like a translation can go bad, but they're not inherently bad. It's just part of the process of making something comprehensible in a new language. So when we talk about the different types of Bible translations in English, it's helpful to remember that almost all of them are technically paraphrases. So within that paraphrase category is then when you get into the word-for-word -word or thought-for-thought -thought approaches that most Bible, charge, Bible charts use to identify their type of translation. Um, and, and again, I should note, if I haven't already, one style is not necessarily better than another. Uh, so I'm going to grab an example from Psalm 103, uh, verse 8, at least in the English, um, English language versification. And uh, I apologize for my Hebrew pronunciation. It's terrible, I expect, but um, at least I'm admitting it up front. So we've got this verse, Rachum v'chanu yava arek afim barab chased. And if you gloss that straight word for word into English, you get merciful and gracious is I am, long nose and great steadfast love. Okay, huh. Merciful and gracious, I am, with an implied verb is in there. Long nose and great steadfast love. Hmm. So let's paraphrase that in a word for word style. Yahweh is merciful and gracious, is long nosed, and has great steadfast love. Hmm. Okay, that made sense, except for the long nosed part. Let's make it more of a thought-for-thought thought paraphrase, so it makes more sense in English. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Oh, that's what long-nosed means. Huh. Hmm. So, you know, the whole thing about taking things, you know, giving for a literal translation. Does your literal Bible say God is long-nosed? Then it's not literal. It's a paraphrase. Almost all of them are paraphrases. But anyway, let's finish the process and go for an imitation. God is merciful and even freely gives gifts. He's not easily angered, but is rich in love and faithful to his promises. That's a perfectly legitimate translation. It's not very faithful to the text in terms of the word for word thing, but it means the same thing. It communicates the same truth. So, you know, different types of translation, different, you know, purposes and different ways of understanding the same text. It's very easy to get elitist or um, other sort of opinionated about what kind of translation or which specific translation is the best. Um, but it's, it's imp so it's important to remind ourselves as we go through these different possibilities that there is more than one way of rendering one language into another language. So I just wanted to wrap this up now with a, a brief introduction or, or listing, I guess, of different translation groups or families or types um, based on what I've just described. So I want to start with the most famous family of translations. I say family because these are translations that are related to each other. One was created and then another one was created based on it with improvements, with um, interaction with ancient manuscripts to try and get back to the original text of the Bible better, or new ways of translating it into English so that people can understand it, uh, things like that. So the most famous is the King James Bible family. It starts with the authorized version, the AV, back published back in uh, 1611. 
That's not the first translation in English, by the way, and it is probably closely related to uh, two or three predecessor translations. But in terms of what's around right now today, this is the first generation of this family that we still have today. From that, you have the RV, the revised versions, um, which came out throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. I only mention that, you know, I mention it even, even though you can't really find them today, um, but just so you know that they exist. The, King, the KJV has gone through changes. So um, if you find KJV Bible, and then you find KJV AV, authorized version Bible, you can know that they are very slightly different because the authorized version refers to 1611, and most of the rest of the King James Bibles that you find today are RV, revised versions, very slightly changed here and there, a few words fixed up. And sometimes the spelling is uh, a bit more in line with modern. And then elsewhere in the family, this comes to the RSV, revised standard version. This was a huge project and a pretty significant accomplishment in the mid 20th century and that brought uh, a lot more modern terminology into the the text of the bible um, some people say it was a little too progressive or liberal in the way it handled things uh, but it was also perhaps the, the main milestone for it is that it was the first to benefit from the information of the dead sea scrolls so um, the old testament text is um, a bit more uh, confident, I guess you could say, in its historicity. From there, you get um, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, and that came out um, in the late 20th century, and that tends to be seen as the more um, liberal member of this family. And as a result, another one was created in the early 2000s, the ESV the English Standard Version, and that is it's more like rolling, path, rolling back past the NRSV, back towards the RSV, but without any more these and thous, and with fewer archaisms, so that it's more in a modern sound. But all of these translations are very closely related. Oh, there's also now also the New King James, NKJV, and I don't remember exactly what distinguishes it. I think it deals with more um, as a modern language updating of the old King J original King James, um, but I, I haven't looked at it very closely. So that's a that's a family of translations. They're all very similar to each other. And you know if you memorize key verses in one of those translations, it will probably be very similar in the other members of that family. Another translation, out there, uh, part of a fam family of sorts is on the technical end, more towards the word for word end of the paraphrase, is the American Standard Bible. You won't find that anymore because there's the new American Standard Bible, the NASB. And that is pretty popular among people who like to study the Bible really. Uh, intentionally and thoroughly. It's a good technical translation. Um, it's wordy and it's not light reading, but it's useful for studying and it's uh, it really helps you um, get at to the, get into the words a bit more. It's not great for public reading or liturgy or use in worship as such because it's a bit clunky sounding and it makes you think uh, a little too long for the purposes of listening. Um, so it's better on the technical end for study. So the ASB, the NASB is sort of at that end of the scale. Another family of, of Bible translations, which has been extremely popular among Protestants, is the New International Version, the NIV. It came out, I believe, in um, the early 1980s, and it was basically the uh, some sort of populist response to the RSV. The RSV was a um, that you know, 1950s-ish landmark translation that almost replaced the King James Bible. The NIV 
was a more populist response saying, all right, let's, let's make this a bit more modern, a little less into the technical side of translation. And it used a much larger group of translators to create it as well. And so the, the, that comes with pluses and minuses. You know, there's less chance of an individual bias carrying through the entire Bible in the NIV, but because it has so many committees and so many different groups of people working on different things, it doesn't have as much consistency across the Bible as most translations might. Because, you know, these, these three people worked on this book and these three people worked on this book and the decisions that they made about how to translate certain words may not always be the same. So key terms across the New Testament and across the Old Testament are not always going to stand out. So uh, nevertheless, though, the NIV became incredibly popular and it was going to be replaced uh, in the 2000s by the TNIV today's new international version, but uh, it got some bad press just as it was coming out and that sort of scuppered the whole project. So you are, will be hard pressed to find the TNIV anywhere. So they tried again in 2011 with the NIV 2011 and th that, that is slowly replacing the NIV on the bookshelves, but um, I th as far as I know most of the fans of the NIV stick to the original NIV and they prefer it. So that's that's that family. It's a good middle of the road translation. And then I should also mention some independence, um, by which I mean translations that make a real point of distancing themselves from the King James family. Not because the King James Bible family is bad or insufficient, um, but just they're so massively influential in the way that we expect to hear the Bible and what we expect it to sound like, uh, that it unconsciously has a huge impact on most Bible translations. So a few independent translations have tried really hard to set aside the expectations of that family and, and come at it from a fresh um, perspective while still being um, scholarly and, and accurate. Uh, and some work better than others. The NET, New English Translation, sometimes called the NET Bible, because it's NET, NET, um, is, is a good example of that. Um, made by a group of scholars and fairly unbiased in terms of theological perspective, and uh, and it was originally offered for free online, so th that was always that was one of its big pluses too early on. In fact, it's probably responsible for the fact that nearly every translation is available online now because they did it online for free and everyone else is like, oh, shucks, now we have to do that too. <laughs> um, also indep relatively independent is the Roman Catholic Standard Translation, the NAB, the New American Bible, although now it's the NAB 2nd Edition, which I'm told is an improvement on the previous edition. I was never particularly impressed with that with the older one, so hopefully this new one is better. Um, it's a bit, I don't know, it, it doesn't feel very real, but maybe that's just my King James family translation bias. I don't know. Um, and then the last independent translation that really should be mentioned is the Amplified Bible. It's called Amplified because everything is in bold in all caps. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> sorry obvious joke. Uh, it's amplified in that it has a very complex system of, itali of, of using italics and parentheses and brackets to provide additional words and phrases for what particular words and phrases might mean. In other words, it gives you multiple translation possibilities for, this, for key words and phrases throughout the Bible. Again, this makes it horrible for reading out loud. It's useless in liturgy. It's just way too distracting, but it's excellent for study. It's probably the best thing you can get for studying the scriptures in as close to the original text as you can get without actually learning any Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. Um, 
but you have to learn how it uses its parentheses and brackets and italics so that you know when it's offering a different translation possibility or um, you know just different uh, the different options and, and features that it has. And then last of all, got to do a shout out for the colloquial translations, the imitation translation style, if you will. There are some translations out there which are intended to be imitations, intended to be colloquial, uh, provincial, uh, very specific in their dialect and approach. The Message by Jordan Peterson, no, Eugene Peterson, gosh, I'm mixing up names here. Eugene Peterson's The Message is by far the most famous example, I think, in this, in this uh, category. So The Message, as you may be aware, goes through the scriptures. It was originally just the New Testament, but he did the Old eventually too. Um, and it just goes through the scriptures in a very casual style. Uh, not that he was casual about the way he translated it. I mean, people love to make fun of the message, but let's be fair. Eugene Peterson was a very attentive scholar, and he did care very much about making the Bible as understandable as possible. This is how I usually describe the usefulness of the message. When a preacher reads a text from the Bible during the sermon, and then he looks back up at the congregation and says, in other words, blah, 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 blah. That's exactly what the message is. <laughs> it's taking a text of the Bible and saying, let's make this as simple as possible. Bum. So yes, sometimes it comes across oversimplified. Yes, sometimes it comes across as a little irreverent, if you like, and um, very lackadaisical and unofficial sounding. But that's exactly the point of it. It's supposed to sound like some ordinary Joe at the gas station or in the restaurant or anywhere um, talking normal American English. That's the whole point of the message. So yeah, it's going to sound dumb if you use it in your church in the worship service. It's going to sound weird, but that's not what it's for. It's for that easy breezy reading or the, in other words, approach to reading the scriptures. So while I would not necessarily recommend the message or any other imitation as your primary Bible reading translation choice, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely has its uses. So let's not make fun of the imitation family. They have, they have their place. Um, the other imitation Bible family translation that I wanted to mention is the Living Bible which is also from roughly the 1970s, thereabouts. Uh, and, but it, it, it got remade into something a bit, more, a bit more formal, the NLT, the New Living Translation. My first impression of that translation was actually very positive because the way it handled certain texts in the New Testament were really quite good in line with um, the stuff that I was learning when I was studying Greek at the time, and it was it was impressive. I have since come across other texts, uh, like in Genesis, um, where the NLT really doesn't feel like it's doing the text full justice. Um, but hey, it's it's an imitation or a very paraphrastic paraphrase, um, and you no, know, it's very readable. Again, that's the point: going for a simpler, easy easier to read, more accessible version of the text, kind of like the message, but not quite as out there. Anyway, so there you go, Bible translations, different types of translation, different families of translations. And if you hold your breath or don't hold your breath, but if you wait for another week and hang, check in again next time, I'll talk again about this subject in terms of advice on choosing translations. So. There you go, your uh, paraphrase translations, which are, you know, you got the gloss, the paraphrase, and the imitations, all that together. So, Bible translations. There you go.